Thank you. Okay, I see the recording on. So I'm yes, going yes. to take yeah. the presentation mode. So good morning, everyone. Uh, super early morning for some of you and maybe good, e good evening. I don't think there is any good afternoon here. Um, so uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining the webinar series. I believe this happens, uh, you know, this is a very active community uh, connecting every week. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you are experts and you know the AI space very well. So this today's talk is going to be a bit of a diversion, but hopefully an interesting diversion uh, for, uh, for, for most of you. Um, can you see my screen? Is yes. it just to confirm? Yes. Okay. So we are going to talk about uh, careers in technology and more specifically, what are the areas that uh, we need to think about as we focus on advancing our careers? And then you will see this, uh, the title as learning the why and the what are as important as the how and the when. And then, you know, as we go through the slides, you, you will have a better appreciation. Uh, so this is going to be a fairly interactive session. So unlike the previous ones where, you know, th there is clearly a lot of very good technical content, I want to keep the, the conversations two-way or multi-way. Um, so feel free to jump in. This is a quick background about uh our company uh, we provide recruiting solutions uh for ai and related talent uh, in in the tech space my own background is uh life sciences uh, in corporate consulting roles and then the, the startup and uh, Blake, um, uh, who is <laughs> the chief uh orchestrator of everything you know that this forum does uh, is, is uh, is, uh, is on our advisory board, and uh, we have operations uh, in, in multiple locations. But let me now switch, and and this is kind of the way we. I I'm hoping we can make this interactive. Let's say, uh, and you know, it's early morning, so uh, I'm sure you're having your cup of tea or coffee. But you know, you just decided you want to climb Mount Everest. Right, and you know you can see the small guy or gal here. That's you. Uh, and now you tell tell this to your family or friends or you know the near and dear one. What what would be the first set of questions you will get? You expect to get from them. You know, I'll take three in the interest of time. So give me three at least the first three uh, comments from from this group. Anyone? Okay. Uh, I'll, uh, you know. So I mean, my me... family would say why you are doing all this, right? So. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, anybody else? Okay. So. As, as Vivek, you pointed out, naturally, the first question would be why, right? Uh, you know, and, and this may be out of concern, if it is a family member, out of curiosity, if it is somebody you know well. Uh, but, you know, they would want to know why do you want to do this? You know, there are clearly some, uh, there is a fair amount of preparation time. There is some risk uh, to, uh, to your health and to your life as well. and and. Uh, so they would want to know the why. Now, keep there, there is a lot that would go into preparing for such a climb, right? A lot of uh, training tools, uh, skills. You know, there is, a, there is conditioning, I'm told, that it will take you several months of living in, you know, high altitude or maybe several weeks, probably not months. Uh, so a lot of that, but that's not the first thing. 
that comes to mind, right? Uh, it's the why. And then, you know, if the why is convincing, they may get into some other uh, aspects, right? Now, let's say, you know, something closer to home. If you have a startup idea and, you know, you want to talk about it. What are the typical questions you should expect to be asked? So, you know, again, this one, I'm opening the floor. Uh, three inputs, uh, not Vivek, <laughs> because you had your chance. Any any inputs? Okay. Well, it's still early morning, so <laughs> you might need a few more sips of your uh, coffee. Uh, but you know. There's going to be a natural question on what problem are you solving? Uh, why pay for it? Even, you know, give me a convincing argument, which is what we generally call as a value proposition. You know, how would you do it? Now you get into kind of the nuts and bolts, right? Uh, you know, in the Everest uh, context, the nuts and bolts would have been uh, the jacket, the gear, the snow um the snow boots and you know oxygen and this and that right here it's it's naturally something very different but keep in mind the the flow of the questions to get to the how is is somewhat you know there is a sequence here right they didn't ask the how first uh and then the when can it be launched plan execution details naturally that will tell you the resources the the funding and so on and so forth. Now, sorry, I just jumped one slide ahead. Uh, in a typical CV that you come across, that we come across a lot of CVs. In a typical CV, the questions that are answered, you, you know, there is very little coverage on the what and the why. You know, it, it gets into the who, it's the, and naturally we need to know the who, who, you know, the, who is the candidate. And then you would typically see a lot of the hows. And, you know, there could be some when, but it, it's, it's a lot of focus on how did I do this or that, right? And, and naturally the this or that is not um, trivial, but you, you, you see that you're jumping straight into again using the Everest analogy or using your startup analogy. Uh, the the people that know you didn't want to get to the how until you you convince them on the what and the why, right? And and that is one of the you know and it's 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 a mindset thing when you're presenting yourself in a CV. You are thinking about everything you have done. You look at a CV from your standpoint. But what the purpose of the CV is to convey what the reader should know. Right? Um, and, and, and that's the key difference in how um, a CV can be made into, um, you know, more informative, more interesting, because a lot of times when we see CVs, it's, you know, it's the, the same, you know, I, I'll put it the way we think about it, it's the same old, right? There is nothing, nothing that stands out. Yes, there are a certain set of skills uh, and they link with the job required. Right, but beyond that, there is no real way to differentiate. Keep in mind, the CV is your filter, right? When when you go, you know, to use an analogy, if you are, uh, you know, and I'm using this just to drive home the point. If if you were on a matrimonial side or some other dating side, uh, your profile is your first step. If your profile was not appealing, it's not going to go to the next step. So you missed your chance, right? 
And, and so that is something that you should really think about what does the audience want to do? Or what should they know versus what you want to tell? Any, any questions? Because I'm going to now switch to some CV samples. Uh, but before that, let me see if you have any questions. No, so are okay. you saying that? So what certain, matters to him? Are you saying certain things in the CV matter? Uh, you know, uh, grab the attention of the uh, hiring manager. Yes, yes, and I'm going to get into that in just a few slides, Vivek. So yeah, thank you for the question. Just hold your thought on that. Um, so. What matters to employees? So hopefully this will start addressing your uh, your question. You know, the employer wants to know the basics. Do you have the education and training? You know, in most cases, that is not, um, you know, a big question. You know, you, you all have very, very good uh, backgrounds, you know, solid education and, and, and training and certification and so on. Um, do you have the skills to do the task? And, and, and a lot of, you know, there's always going to be a lot of skills in the CV. Um, there is, I will say there is a lot of skill inflation that happens. Uh, what we have seen is a CV typically has at least anywhere from 30 to 50% skill inflation. And what I mean by skill inflation is, uh, you know, you put a skill if you have, and when I say you, naturally it's not you, but a candidate may put a skill uh, if they had even had a you know a cursory exposure, uh, but then when it comes down to experiences, you don't see uh, that skill being utilized in any of the experiences. Um, you know, a, a common example is 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 the cloud. You know, if if you've just operated in a cloud, that's one thing, but uh, you know. Uh, managing a cloud environment with, with all the the infrastructure, uh, the uh, you know the setup and other things, it's a whole different set of skills. And and we see that you know a lot of times there is claim of cloud skills when they've really just operated in a cloud environment, just like you know any other server. Um, have you learned and applied new skills on the job? So now it's getting to where you can start differentiating yourself. It's not just the skill that you acquired, but how did you apply? And did you learn any new skills on the job? Um, how effectively can you solve a problem? This is, I would say, very few CVs can actually, <clears throat> just by reading the CVs, you can actually judge this. So this question is, the, I would say, one of the least answered questions in, in a CV. Uh, what is your approach to overcoming challenges? Now, this I understand is more of an interview question, but the more you can talk about, you know, even in any project, you would have challenges. You know, if 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 there was a project which faced no challenges, then it really wasn't a project. It was, you know, it it may be just a very routine task, which then kind of conveys, you know you are not operating in a complicated zone. Uh, are you an individual performer or a team player? Um, you know, it's important to convey that if, if you're part of a team, how did you help, you know, bring the team contribution to a level if, you know, if you had that option. If you didn't, that's perfectly fine, but you, you should be able to convey your ability to perform in an individual capacity as well as in a team. Uh, can you deliver results on time? This is again something that you rarely see in a CV. Uh, the result orientation of a candidate is extremely important and one of the least addressed uh, topics in a CV. Um, and, and what is the quality of your results? So naturally, if you deliver the results, uh, let's say you were working on a client project, you know, what was the feedback from the client? Um, you know, if the feedback was good, naturally 
you want to talk about it. If the feedback was constructive, then at least you should be able to reflect that in some way that, you know, upon feedback, we did some few iterations and we got this to where they wanted it to be, you know, something like that. Um, so these are, again, you will see some of these are very natural questions, but others are not something that a typical candidate would address in their seat. And, and I'm going to bring a concept here. Uh, we all about, you hear about career progression, right? And, you know, the career ladder. Uh, I'm, I'm going to convey ladder to have a very specific meaning. You know, in the context of how you view uh, every experience and how you can use this concept uh, to capture your experience in a CV and then even to communicate as, as, you, know, as you interact with uh, interviewers and with others. You know, and, and LADDER is, is essentially an acronym in, in this concept to learn, apply, develop or delegate. Right. If you're an individual, you may not have the chance to delegate. But you know, if you're working in a team, maybe this is part of your um, uh, team approach. How do you deal with challenges? Uh, evaluate progress. Uh, this is an important one because you know it's not just doing, but how well were you doing, and how did you measure how you were progressing? And then reporting the results, ref refining it, revising it, you know, uh, no first attempt is going to be perfect. We, we, everybody recognizes, if, you know, if it was a perfect first attempt, then again, it was not something challenging enough. Uh, but, you know, how you uh, refine and revise that is, is an important piece. And how can you apply this concept of a ladder to your CV? So, uh, you know, this is a bit philosophical, but a CV gives you a very good opportunity to present your storybook. This is the story of your professional life, right? Um, e think of each experience as a chapter in the book. You know, a, a book has a totality, but every chapter uh, can be read on its own. And so think about your chapter should be engaging enough that if they didn't read any other chapter that chapter itself can speak something about you uh, and and those experiences give you an opportunity to describe something special about yourself again you know the the, the idea here is to to make it impactful interesting and those experiences can be formulated into some of these questions and and i'll show you how it links to the the concept of a ladder in, in, in just a minute. Um, the question you could ask when you're thinking about every experience is what was the goal or the problem that was being um, solved and what was the solution, right? Very, you know, very intuitive. Uh, what skills did you apply to develop the solution? So again, this the focus here is not just the skills you have but the skills you are able to apply. Uh, it, it, it's a different thought process. What challenges did you face and how did you deal with them? And how did you evaluate progress and what were the final results? So this is you know, kind of that linkage to the concept of the ladder. So the point here is every experience can be thought through in, by answering these questions and hopefully you can then put it into your CV in a way that makes it a lot more interesting than, you know, uh, I did A, B, C, and, and then X, Y, Z. Okay, so now let me stop again and, and see if there are any questions. Okay, so these are some sample CVs. Again, these are um, not meant to, these are de-identified because we will never talk about these, but these are real CVs. So uh, what you, you know, one clear observation, if you look at this is, this is too wordy. 
it, it, you know, it, it doesn't have the messages in it. You just have to read through and, and believe me, nobody's going to read through every bullet in, in this. Uh, I'm thinking thing, that it will it will put off a recruiter immediately because it's too much to read. It's very hard to read. <laughs> well, yes, one is that it's too read and there is no, you know, messaging format. Because, and, and you will see as we go through some other CDs about how uh, a messaging format can make this better, right? Uh, but the other thing is, uh, you know, there is a, we see a lot of CVs carry in, you know, these different formats with one column on one side of the page, uh, which will have a lot of information, you know, if projects are a key aspect of your um, experience, please do not put this in a sidebar. Because a sidebar is a sidebar, right? The intent of a sidebar is something, you know, the, which does not require the same level of attention. Um, and, and a project is, is probably one of the most important things uh, in, in your experience. The other thing is most, CVs now get parsed through automated tools. Uh, and if you have too much of the, the this formatting, uh, you will lose on some of the content not getting parsed through appropriately. So the simpler your CV format is in, in terms of you know um, uh, content parsing, the higher is the chance that your content will actually make it into a review. Uh, this is another sample CV, uh, you know, and, and this is a fairly senior, this is an experienced person, 10, somewhat close to 10 years. Uh, the structure is better. You can see, you know, it, it's not overwhelming with a lot of content, you know, in the one uh, list of bullets. Uh, it's it's more concise, but the latter approach is missing. And what I mean by that is, you know, how the, how the application was done, and, and some of the other things about uh, the the challenges, the results, they they are not there. Um, and, and and generally, what would happen is this will again be you know seen as okay. Uh, these these are the you can see that there is a highlight on the skills. So all and the skills are generally mentioned in another section of the CV. So all they are trying to do is draw attention to what skills I have. But you know that's not enough. You know skills are necessary for you know any review of a candidate profile, but they are not sufficient. So this one has. It clearly misses the latter approach. Uh, this is another sample CV. Uh, better structure because you know now you can start seeing. The, the, you know, they want they they given you a nice structure: the client, the project, the technologies, the role, uh, and then the, there is the project description, which conveys. I mean, it's kind of an embedded just a few words which conveys the key goal to improve the app to provide new functionality right that's your key goal uh, it's stated but it's it's not stated in a very obvious way you you have to read through yeah, ideally i would have said i would have preferred goal improve the app with new functionality i you know in in the new functionality you could describe what functionality was intended to be added but at least this is going in the right direction uh, you have a lot of responsibilities. Uh, now, this is something we see a lot again in CV. There are some obvious statements that, you know, you use SQL to load data. Now, you know, and, and I'm not a technical expert, but there is no insight. And I'm just using this as an example. There's no insight about, you know, your work. You, you know, it's like saying I uh, did uh, analysis in Excel, right? I mean, uh, that's 
that's good if you're in high school, but not at this level of scale. Uh, and, and the other thing that is missing here is you stated the goal to improve the app, but nowhere in your description is it stated that on how the app was improved on any outcomes. You know, remember the, the, the R part of the ladder, the results. So, you know, it's, it's heading in the right direction, but it still has several gaps. Uh, this is a better CV, you know, a lot more concise. You can start seeing now, you know, the, 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 the extent of the description is coming down, but that doesn't mean the impact is going to be less. It says the major objective of the topic is to improve the performance of the data and, uh, you know, as data migrating and, right? You've described it again. It's a it's a good format, but outcomes are not there. Challenges faced are not there. Um, you know how you applied your skills you could have, uh, you know, done a little more justice to that. Um, so, moving in the right direction, results are missing. Uh, this is a fairly senior level person. Um, I would say. In terms of the presentation, the format is is still too dense here because it doesn't, you know, compared to this structure, this is a lot easier to read. This structure is a lot more dense. What I suspect is because the, you know, the person has so many years of experience that it was trying, they were trying to put this into, you know, into one or two pages. But the part that they have done well is they use, uh, you know, the, uh, a CV is your limited real estate. It's like going into a shop, you know, how, how you put the different items within a shop uh, could drive your sales, you know, more or less, right? And so your CV is your personal shop. And he has used this part to summarize the role, function, signs of the team, you know, they've He's been an architect, a project manager, engineering, data science, um, and his team size has gone from zero to a few hundreds. Frankly, I, I would have put that into maybe uh, a few uh, you know, more discreet sections, but again, the, they, their intent was probably to compress a lot of information. Uh, this is very results oriented. So if you had to look at an example of what would catch attention, and and I always, uh, you know, I, I say- No, but I, I was, you know, the font is still too small, no? I, I agree, I agree. This is, that's why I was saying this is dense because he or she is trying to package this into one or two pages. So they made the font size, plus in trying to put this into a PowerPoint, it has gone shrunk even more. Because I try to, you know, naturally to de-identify, I could only pick a certain section and then put it into a slide. Um, but if you look at, even with the small font size, the results are very clear. Um, cut cost 10%, he's given the base number. Uh, uh, Mm -hmm. Cloud, you know, five uh, percent. If if there is beyond, you know, your GPA, if there is any other number in the CV, it has probably a five times higher chance of being than somebody's reading it versus pure text. So you know, so just you know, hopefully that's a key takeaway. Uh, when, when you think about communicating your um, story. Uh, and, you know, something that we are still not seeing in a, how should I say, in, uh, as commonly as I would like. Uh, a GitHub profile is 
a very important aspect of you know a cv of a tech professional it it would not be important for somebody in a different field but for tech professional get a profile is an important link to provide we are still not seeing i would say only 10% of the cvs that we come across have a github profile link uh, I, I would almost say if you are a developer uh, of any form uh, it's almost a must have uh, and the reason is this demonstrates you know your philosophy about learning especially if you've done um, uh, if you've posted in in public repositories uh, and it must be more than just you know if you did a course project and you posted it that that's acceptable to get you started that's acceptable if you're a student and you're looking for an internship but if you are a working professional which i'm assuming most of the people in this forum are uh, it would have to be something more substantive than just a course project and it gives you an opportunity to highlight that if you contributed to any open source projects or if you started something and somebody else contributed that's building on the body of knowledge um, i would almost go to the extent of saying that if i had a top tier uh, a, a candidate from a top tier university uh, you know in, in in india you know these are the iits and iits with zero github posts versus somebody who is from let's say tier 2 but is a lot more active on github i would go with you know uh, the more active on github as a preferred candidate because uh, he or she is demonstrating an ongoing learning mindset. Uh, another thing that GitHub can do is if you don't have enough experience, uh, GitHub can be your, um, your tool to demonstrate that even though you didn't get a chance to have a lot of real world experience, uh, your Curiosity is driving you to do all of these other things, and um, and and this naturally, if it's a public repo, it can be shared with with everyone. If it is a private, which you're doing for code management for your organization, uh, naturally you cannot share it, but uh, you can you can talk about it, um, and and so this gives you another tool. Uh, in, in, in again, in showing who you are as a professional. Uh, there was a question. Uh, yeah. uh, for experienced folks, do we mention all experience or last three jobs only? Or last one we can combine as one? Because, you know, yeah. let's say I've been doing 10 projects, eight projects in my lifetime. So should I show all of them? or I should show the most prominent ones only. And let's say I change jobs five times, seven times, then? Yeah, so yeah, good question. So uh, I would say, you know, you should definitely put all the jobs you have done, right? Uh, you can choose to elaborate your experiences only, let's say, in the jobs in the last five years. Uh, let's say you were uh, in the 10 to 15 year experience bracket um, and you know it, it also depends on the the job profile you're applying for if the job profile is something where your last five years experience is most relevant then you can just elaborate on those uh, but not do so do give the full disclosure of all of the other jobs, but you don't need to elaborate on every experience in, in the other ones. Uh, sometimes a job may need a skill that you have used, you know, many years ago, and you may want to highlight that. Uh, and then you would naturally need to show how you've stayed uh, current with those skills. But that could be an area. But otherwise, you can you know you can de-emphasize the previous one, but don't uh, don't hide them. Do uh, provide the disclosure because that way we will know if you graduated 
15 years ago and you only show five years of experience, then it naturally brings the question mark of what happens in the other 10 years. Any other questions? So friends, we can ask questions by speaking as well, or you can put your questions in the chat. Honey, you have a question, go for it. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask that for uh, PhD like scholars uh, who are building their profile into uh, tech field. So if, if they, what should be the priority? Should be the priority of projects that they should put forward in the CV or the publication that they should put forward into CV. And also for the GitHub, most of the time they are bound that if you are working under IIT system, you cannot put public like disclosure in your GitHub profile. So most of the time they are in the private format. So do does it affect uh, uh, like your selection? Um, so let me take this uh, one at a time. If you're a PhD, surely your research, your excellence in research is a key measure. So publications, uh, absolutely, you should put it. Uh, I would say in the publications, give some metric of how often was your publication cited, if that's available. Okay. Uh, you should also surely mention the projects you've done, if, you know, mm -hmm. even if they were as a grad, uh, postgraduate student. Uh, mention that, again, you can make a call based on the relevance, right? Um, if if it was not relevant to the job you're applying, you can just state that that was one experience you have. If it was relevant, you can elaborate. Um, and then on your GitHub, yes, I mean uh, you if it if your organization does not allow public posts, that's perfectly understandable. Um, you can you know you can state that these are the projects and they are available in the private repos, so you cannot talk about it. But at the same time, uh, if you have some public projects, it, it always helps to convey, um, you know, I like to think of the, you know, uh, we, we all like to think about lifelong learners. Uh, but we, we need to show that in, in something more than a statement. And, and GitHub is probably one of the best ways. I think it's one of the most powerful ways right now. Uh, for tech professionals to show their lifelong learning mindset. OK, thank you. Sure. Any any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry, I cannot see the name, so I may not um, call out your name. No problem. So, uh, I, like, I have been I have uh, been working in IT since last um, eight nine years. But yeah, I I couldn't start up with my GitHub profile mostly like because I have been working in organizations and I didn't pay attention to how to build a person profile. So, uh, as a, as someone who is maybe starting, uh, what do you recommend to start up with? Like, I have uh, done some very small small code snippets, but uh, not any project. So what are your recommendations for that? Uh, I would say if if you can pick an area where you can, in, in an open source field, where you can contribute. So you don't need to start a new project. But if there is some contribution you can do to an existing open source forum, right? it will have to go through uh, the review and vetting process because uh, the um, the repo owners will have some mechanism to review, but that could be one way to get started. Um, you know, uh, the, the, and the, there are a lot of, at least the space and I know uh, well are, is in, in, in these libraries. There are so many hundreds if if not thousands of libraries now which are handled through open source contributions and you can pick one area and and uh, get deep into it uh, and and make a contribution
Okay, got it. Thanks. Does that help? No, yeah. so I didn't get this part. So let's say we haven't developed a GitHub profile so far. Mm -hmm. So it's going to damage our job prospects. So should we well, start uh, now if we have not started yet? I would say uh, I wouldn't use the word damage, but it would definitely enhance your job prospects if you have a GitHub profile. Um, and, and especially for higher end roles. Uh, in fact, I see now uh, some job profiles ask for um, you know community contributions that you may have done in the space. Um, you know, and, and and getting a paper out is a very long and complex exercise. Uh, the postgraduate students they 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 do it well they are required to do uh, but um you know something like github it gives you a way to um, you know get involved in the the academic community you know i get a couple of calls each week and they you know from mid management professionals so they are facing a classic quagmire and this has been happening since many many years i am seeing that they have become managers or first level leads or second senior managers and now they are thinking that career has hit a wall and they have to go back to being tech but trying to being tech again after many years of not doing tech is so hard Right, so and all these new things have come. So these man development managers have been managing developer developer teams, but when they have to look for a job themselves, they they really need those hands-on skills which they, they no longer have. They haven't even tried in years, so because the team was doing it. So so how are these mid management professionals? Are they supposed to start coding again? I mean, uh, because functional or management skills are clearly not helping them get jobs or grow fast. And all these new technologies are there, which they don't know. So what, what should a manager level person do? This question has been foxing so many. And even I try to counsel these people, but I don't have a very clear you know, strategy for them. What should a mid-level manager do? They are no longer hands-on. But without hands-on, they are out of touch with these new technologies. And they don't qualify in interviews. Are they supposed to go yeah. back to school and learn, you know, technical hands-on Python notebooks again? Well, how what they're supposed to do? Yeah, no, it's a it, it's a, it, it's a it's a very uh, natural situation that many in this what I call as middle management space are are dealing with. Uh, I you know I would say if if you truly want to keep yourself current um the first ingredient is curiosity um and and with so much around you available now you know this is not the same as when we were students uh, which is uh, you know in the pre internet era when you did not have access to you know information uh, but with so much around you, you uh, the your ability to whet your curiosity appetite is only limited by how strong of an appetite you have. And uh, if it, it, it doesn't have to be code writing, but even just exploring and, and you know participating in in the let's say I know this forum is mostly all AI. Uh, but participating in this forum and just understanding uh, what is going on um, will, will help you to get more current. Um, you know, it, it doesn't require code writing. In fact, I mean, there is an argument being made, and, and, and I don't know if it's a valid one or not, is, um, you know, just basic coding skills can be automated right but it's the solution orientation or it's the application part which at least uh, you know i i believe it's it's not at the risk of getting automated uh, 
because that requires creative thinking. Uh, you know, creative thinking uh, does, uh, you know, human side of creative thinking is purely driven by curiosity. Right? And, and it's not restricted by a model. Remember, uh, I mean, again, I'm not the expert in, in anything to do with AI. Uh, but it, the predictions are, as I understand, bound by the data that's used to feed it. Right? Well, in your case, your um, imagination, your curiosity is unbounded. So you know, use that to your advantage. I know this sounds more philosophical, but uh, but at the core, I truly believe it is curiosity. So I'm hearing that basically we have to still have solutioning skills and be curious enough to attend all these forums to be aware of the latest things going around. Right. So even as a first level or second level managers or tech leads who are no longer coding, they still need to be aware of the latest things going on, at least from these forums or reading papers, blogs and still yeah. have the solutioning skills to do the new kind of solutions, even though they may not be direct coders. Uh, so I'll, that's I'll what I heard a, from you, yeah. yeah. I'll give you a simple example. And, and, and you know this is coming from someone who is not a tech expert. Uh, NVIDIA, obviously, is, is, <laughs> is now the global poster child for AI. Uh, when NVIDIA got started, they were focused purely, I mean, the whole terminology of GPU is for gaming, right? And until uh, about a year or year and a half ago, NVIDIA was known purely for its gaming and its ability to pivot to, not pivot, but essentially play into uh, the AI space, you know, what enabled it? And why was it a better position to do it versus many other chip companies, right? You know. Uh, again, I'm, I, I don't know the why, but that's a curiosity question. It, it, if you, I'm sure that if you spend just a few hours, you will know a lot more about it than what you did, you know, a few hours back. Go ahead. Any, we we have some, a few more minutes. So yeah, friends, let's ask any questions we might have on careers uh, and, and tech upskilling and so forth. Uh, this is a good forum to discuss our career inquiries. You know, with the layoffs and all, uh, particularly in the Western markets, the situation is not very good for job market. So it is uh, important that we work as a community and and then sort of you know uh, get some career counseling and support in what areas we need to skill in how do we skill what skills are needed right so uh, if we are a fresher uh, you know because you know i i read a report saying that 80 percent plus of engineering graduates from india are not going to get you know a uh, full employment uh, which is at par with their engineering degree 80% of folks either won't get jobs in engineering or will be underemployed. So it's looking quite uh, drastic. And this is happening when companies are making record profits, right? So you saw the quarterly results of Microsoft, NVIDIA, and others. And uh, I was just talking to somebody in Beria earlier the, this morning, and it is Friday night in Beria. And they are saying that uh, it's very dire. And all the companies, in spite of record profits, they are just laying off in hordes. And there are folks in Bay Area, uh, you know, who are not able to get placed. And so, uh, so uh, you know, we have to work as a community and see uh, how we can upskill ourselves or find the right connections. How to make these resumes properly so we get the attention we need in the next interview rounds. So ask your questions here. This is a good forum for this kind of discussion. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mayurakshi De. My question is that I have been working in legacy systems mainframes for the past 11 years. So uh, what is the best way to transition to more uh, uh, newer technologies and uh, what approach should I take? 
Okay. Um, so I believe legacy systems are still the mainstay of many applications. Um, so it, it's not something that will become obsolete, but what you can do, you know, the trend is obviously everything going to the cloud. Um, and what you could consider is if you can upskill or add to your skills uh, with, you know, uh, let's say a migration kind of exercise. If this, you know, if your application were to go from on-prem to cloud, what are the things you would need to know? Uh, and that way, it's a natural extension. Uh, you know, you you were in the legacy system mainframes, um, I'm assuming, and now you have the ability to handle uh, cloud projects, right? So that brings you uh, into a lot more current space. That's at least one area I can think of, but I'm sure there might be others too. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the advice. Welcome. Uh, I'll offer my two cents here. So I feel that, uh, you know, in technological kind of careers or engineering careers at large, uh, you know, lifelong upskilling is sort of a given. So the opportunity in engineering careers is, is high compared to many other fields which may find it more difficult maybe. But the the problem is one has to upskill and, and reinvent oneself oneself couple of times in, in one's lifetime career, and uh, you know when you were uh, you know hot in Java, but then Java became commodity, right? And then you learn mobile apps, and then mobile apps became a commodity. So this cycle goes on and on. Currently is the time of AI in data science, but eventually it will commoditize as well, and these tools will automate most of the programming, a lot of the design work as well. So there's always the next thing. So we have to constantly reinvent ourselves in the new technological stack. That's just the nature of this business. And there are a lot of online courses and these kind of communities like the one we run in Cellshat, uh, which allow us to upskill, right? So we have to keep learning. And I, neither of us can survive professionally if we don't constantly reinvent ourselves. Hey. Uh... This is Viresh here. Okay. Uh, I had a question. How how is the trend towards quantum con computing is growing with respect to careers right now? So that people, if they want, they can actually prepare right. I mean, from this time itself. We know it's uh, it's a time for AI, ML, and uh, generative AI kind of stuff. Now that's the season going on. But I believe. What they were thinking was next best was quantum computing. I mean, is it really that hype? Or any idea? So I don't know about quantum computing. Um, you know, as as a as a technology area, uh, what we know is based on requirements we see from clients. And at this point, I don't see, uh, frankly any um, any requirements which require that specific skills now it may be because uh, we uh, are we don't operate in in that space it's it's clearly more in the research domain from what i understand uh, you know and and i want to just connect this to uh, the the earlier topic of the why right uh, you know there, yes there is a, a there is a, this thinking about what is the flavor of the day. But the core question one has to ask is why, right? Why is AI beginning to take off now? When, you know, uh, and, and it's, it, it's a combination of factors. It's a combination of uh, data getting to a, the, a size which is uh, makes it more effective uh, computing power getting to a capability that makes you know that feasible and and people's uh, you know people's need to i mean that that will always be there to find something more efficient um, 
you know, in, in any technology, if these things come together around the same time, you could see, um, you know, you could see a breakout. You see another area where such a breakout is happening is in, uh, in electric vehicles. Um, you know, we may not see that as much in India, but uh, in countries like China and EU, EVs are now almost 20 to 25 percent of all new car sales. And and think about you know the disruption. Think about the mechanic who has been trained his entire life uh, to work on um, uh, you know normal in internal combustion engines. Uh, he he has a shop and he doesn't know anything about EVs. But the mechanics are very good in uh, in self learning. I remember there was a time when cars were moving from. Uh, a, a normal injection system to a fuel injector based delivery and you know they adapted and and so they're going to face some very significant disruption disruption and uh, and, and they're learning to adapt to that so um the, the point i'm making here is uh, this can happen in any space you just need to have that uh, uh, learning mindset Yeah, thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah, Dinesh here. So actually, I'm currently a backend developer with around four years experience. So uh, and I got uh, admission from the Georgia Tech in US for master's in computer science. So my question was like, uh, considering the current challenging job market, so do you see is it worthwhile to pursue computer science in US? I mean, would it be a sensible decision? Or I mean, a backend developer like me who has already four years experience in India, or I should rather focus on upskilling myself in AI domain uh, and then switch jobs here itself in India. I mean, given that how software engineering roles will, I mean, I'm not sure if they will remain prominent in future as of now. So, um, you know, this, this is a very individual call. I would. Uh, you know, my ability to, to to guide would be purely in terms of my own perspective. But uh, I, I, again, if you keep a lifelong learning mindset, then uh, a graduate program presents a very good learning opportunity. Um, you know, whether it's in India or the US, uh, that, that's another call to be made. But to me, if it fits in your overall profile, uh, pursuing uh, a postgraduate uh, coursework, you know, gives you a very good learning opportunity, which is somewhat un, um, you know, unburdened by, uh, you know, if you were to do this in a job, you're going to be constantly bound by uh, the parameters of the job. So that's that's just my philosophy. But uh, you know, others may have a different. Uh, thinking around it mm, okay and how do you see the i mean the role of i mean general software engineering roles in future i mean that's a you know software engineering is not going to go away I, I can you know i i think anybody would uh would agree to that uh you you just have to be in in, in the right space um you know, uh, I mean, the people, you, if you look at the profile of people who are in open AI, who work in open AI, they were, you know, five until five years ago, or maybe even two years ago, nobody had heard about them, but they are mostly all graduate students who come from, you know, very good programs uh, with naturally a connection to AI, right? Whether it's in Toronto, whether it's in uh, EU, uh, so they, they are all, they, many of them are graduate students. In fact, when the this whole fiasco about Sam Altman being, uh, being thrown off uh, the CEO role, the person who was his chosen as a successor, um, she is a very accomplished uh, postgraduate, um, I forget which university she's from. Uh, so you know the right talent will find the right place uh, there's no question about that 
um, you know, it's it's hard to uh, try to project which line will have uh, the you know better job prospects. But if you're good in what you do, um, uh, you will find the opportunities. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are out of time, and uh, thank you all. Um, if you have any question, you can channel it to Vivek and uh, would be happy to respond. Thank you all. Have a good day. Sunil, you can write your uh, you know number uh, and, and, and LinkedIn profile maybe in the Google chat here uh, for audience to be able to reach out to you. I've already shared my number, but you can share your number as well. OK, I'm going to send my email. And uh, I I would prefer email communications. Um, so I'm just sending that. And you can, anybody can reach out to me on this. OK, uh, interesting webinar. Any final comments or questions, folks? Okay, thanks, Sunil. Okay. Uh, nice thank uh, presentation. Interesting thank career thank advice. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank, thank you, audience, you. Thank for you joining. All for, thank you for participating.